Chapter One of The Angel of the Revolution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kevin Green. The Angel of the Revolution by George Griffith. Chapter One At the Eleventh Hour. Victory! It flies! I am master of the powers of the air, at last! They were strange words to be uttered, as they were by a pale, haggard, half-starved-looking young fellow in a dingy, comfortless room on the top floor of a South London tenement house, and yet there was a triumphant ring in his voice, and a clear, bright flush on his thin cheeks that spoke at least for his own absolute belief in their truth. Let us see how far he was justified in that belief. To begin at the beginning, Richard Arnold was one of those men whom the world is wont to call dreamers and enthusiasts before they succeed, and heaven-born geniuses and benefactors of humanity afterwards. He was twenty-six, and for nearly six years past he had devoted himself, soul and body, to a single idea, to the so far unsolved problem of aerial navigation. This idea had haunted him ever since he had been able to think logically at all, first dimly at school, and then more clearly at college, where he had carried everything before him in mathematics and natural science, until it had at last become a ruling passion that crowded everything else out of his life, and made him, commercially speaking, that most useless of social units, a one-idead man, whose idea could not be put into working form. He was an orphan, with hardly a blood relation in the world. He had started with plenty of friends, mostly made at college, who thought he had a brilliant future before him, and therefore looked upon him as a man whom it might be useful to know. But as time went on, and no results came, these dropped off, and he got to be looked upon as an amiable lunatic, who was wasting his great talents and what money he had on impracticable fancies, when he might have been earning a handsome income, if he had stuck to the beaten track, and gone in for practical work. The distinctions that he had won at college, and the reputation he had gained as a wonderfully clever chemist and mechanician, had led to several offers of excellent positions in great engineering firms, but to the surprise and disgust of his friends he had declined them all. No one knew why, for he had kept his secret with the the almost passionate jealousy of the true enthusiast, and so his refusals were put down to sheer foolishness, and he became numbered with the geniuses who are failures, because they are not practical. When he came of age, he had inherited a couple of thousand pounds, which had been left in trust to him by his father. Had it not been for that two thousand pounds, he would have been forced to employ his knowledge and his talents conventionally, and would probably have made a fortune but it was just enough to relieve him from the necessity of earning his living for the time being, and to make it possible for him to devote himself entirely to the realisation of his life dream, at any rate until the money was gone. Of course, he yielded to the temptation. Nay, he never gave the other course a moment's thought. Two thousand pounds would last him for years, and no one could have persuaded him that, with complete leisure, freedom from all other concerns, and money for the necessary experiments, he would not have succeeded long before his capital was exhausted. So he put the money into a bank whence he could draw it out as he chose, and withdrew himself from the world to work out the ideal of his life. Year after year passed, and still success did not come. He found practice very different from theory and in a hundred details he met with difficulties he had never seen on paper. Meanwhile his money melted away in costly experiments, which only raised hopes that ended in bitter disappointment. His wonderful machine was a miracle of ingenuity, and was mechanically perfect in every detail save one. It would do no practical work. Like every other inventor who had grappled with the problem, he had found himself constantly faced with that fatal ratio of weight to power. No engine that he could devise would do more than lift itself and the machine. Again and again he had made a toy that would fly, as others had done before him, but a machine that would navigate the air as a steamer or an electric vessel navigated the waters 
carrying cargo and passengers, was still an impossibility, while that terrible problem of weight and power remained unsolved. In order to eke out his money to the uttermost, he had clothed and lodged himself meanly, and had denied himself everything but the barest necessaries of life. Thus he had prolonged the struggle for over five years of toil and privation and hope deferred, and now, when his last sovereign had been changed and nearly spent, success, real, tangible, practical success, had come to him, and the discovery that was to be to the twentieth century what the steam-engine had been to the nineteenth was accomplished. He had discovered the true motive power at last. Two liquefied gases, which, when united, exploded spontaneously, were admitted by a clockwork escapement in minute quantities into the cylinders of his engine, and worked the pistons by the expansive force of the gases generated by the explosion. There was no weight but the engine itself and the cylinders containing the liquefied gases. Furnaces, boilers, condensers, accumulators, dynamos, all the ponderous apparatus of steam and electricity were done away with, and he had a power at a command greater than either of them. There was no doubt about it. The moment that his trembling fingers set the escapement mechanism in motion, the model that embodied the thought and labour of years rose into the air as gracefully as a bird on the wing, and sailed round and round in obedience to its rudder, straining hard at the string which prevented it from striking the ceiling. It was weighted in strict proportion to the load that the full-sized airship would have to carry. To increase this was merely a matter of increasing the power of the engine and the size of the floats and fans. The room was a large one, for the house had been built for a better fate than letting in tenements, and it ran from back to front, with a window at each end. Out of doors there was a strong breeze blowing, and as soon as Arnold was sure that his ship was able to hold its own in still air, he threw both the windows open and let the wind blow straight through the room. Then he drew the airship down, straightened the rudder, and set it against the breeze. In almost agonised suspense he watched it rise from the floor, float motionless for a moment, then slowly forged ahead in the teeth of the wind, gathering speed as it went. It was then that he had uttered that triumphant cry of VICTORY! All the long years of privation and hope deferred vanished in that one supreme moment of innocent and bloodless conquest, and he saw himself master of a kingdom as wide as the world itself. He let the model fly the length of the room before he stopped the clockwork and cut off the motive power, allowing it to sink gently to the floor. Then came the reaction. He looked steadfastly at his handiwork for several moments in silence, and then he turned and threw himself onto a shabby little bed that stood in one corner of the room, and burst into a flood of tears. Triumph had come, but had it not come too late? He knew the boundless possibilities of his invention, but they had still to be realised. To do this would cost thousands of pounds, and he had just one half-crown and a few coppers. Even these were not really his own, for he was already a week behind with his rent, and another payment fell due the next day. That would be twelve shillings in all, and if it was not paid he would be turned into the street. As he raised himself from the bed, he looked despairingly round the bare, shabby room. No, there was nothing there that he could pawn or sell. Everything saleable had gone already to keep up the struggle of hope against despair. The bed and washstand, the plain deal table, and the one chair that comprised the furniture of the room were not his. A little carpenter's bench, a few worn tools, and odds and ends of scientific apparatus, and a dozen well-used books. These were all that he possessed in the world now, save the clothes on his back, and a plain painted sea-chest, in which he was wont to lock up his precious model when he had to go out. His model? No, he could not sell that. At best it would fetch but the price of an ingenious toy, and without the secret of the two gases it was useless. But was not that worth something? Yes, if he did not starve to death before he could persuade any one that there was money in it. Besides, the chest and its priceless contents would be seized for the rent next day, and then— God help me! What am I to do? 
The words broke from him like a cry of physical pain and ended in a sob, and for all answer there was the silence of the room, and the inarticulate murmur of the streets below coming up through the open windows. He was weak with hunger and sick with excitement, for he had lived for days on bread and cheese, and that day he had eaten nothing since the crust that had served him for breakfast. His nerves too were shattered by the intense strain of his final trial and triumph, and his head was getting light. With a desperate effort he recovered himself, and the heroic resolution that had sustained him through his long struggle came to his aid again. He got up and poured some water from the ewer into a cracked cup and drank it. It refreshed him for the moment, and he poured the rest of the water over his head. That steadied his nerves and cleared his brain. He took up the model from the floor, laid it tenderly and lovingly in its usual resting place in the chest. Then he locked the chest, and sat down upon it to think the situation over. Ten minutes later he rose to his feet and said aloud, "'It's no use. I can't think on an empty stomach. I'll go out and have one more good meal, if it's the last I ever have in the world, and then perhaps some ideas will come.' So saying, he took down his hat, buttoned his shabby velveteen coat to conceal his lack of a waistcoat, and went out, locking the door behind him as he went. Five minutes' walk brought him to the Blackfriars Road, and then he turned towards the river and crossed the bridge, just as the motley stream of city workers was crossing it in the opposite direction on their homeward journey. At Ludgate Circus he went into an eating-house and fared sumptuously on a plate of beef, some bread and butter and a pint mug of coffee. As he was eating, a paper-boy came in and laid an echo on the table at which he was sitting. He took it up mechanically, ran his eye carelessly over the columns. He was in no humour to be interested by the tattle of an evening paper, but in a paragraph under the heading of Foreign News, a once familiar name caught his eye, and he read the paragraph through. It ran as follows. Railway Outrage in Russia when the Berlin-Petersburg Express stopped last night at Kovno, the first stop after passing the Russian frontier, a shocking discovery was made in the smoking compartment of the palace car which had been on the train for the last few months. Colonel Dornovich, of the Imperial Police, who is understood to have been on his return journey from a secret mission to Paris, was found stabbed to the heart and quite dead. In the centre of the forehead were two short straight cuts in the form of a T, reaching to the bone. Not long ago Colonel Doranovich was instrumental in unearthing a formidable nihilist conspiracy, in connection with which over fifty men and women of various social ranks were exiled for life to Siberia. The whole affair is wrapped in the deepest mystery the only clue in the hands of the police being the fact that the cross cut on the forehead of the victim indicates that the crime is the work not of the nihilists proper but of that unknown and mysterious society usually alluded to as the terrorists not one of whom has ever been seen save in his crimes how the assassin managed to enter and leave the car unperceived while the train was going at full speed is an apparently insoluble riddle. Saving the victim and the attendants, the only passengers in the car who had not retired to rest, were another officer in the Russian service, and Lord Allenmere, who was travelling to St. Petersburg to resume, after leave of absence, the duties of the secretaryship to the British Embassy, to which he was appointed some two years ago. Why, that must be the Lord Allenmere who was at Trinity in my time or rather Viscount Tremaine, as he was then, mused Arnold, as he laid the paper down. We were very good friends in those days. I wonder if he'd know me now, and lend me a ten-pound note to get me out of the infernal fix I'm in. I believe he would, for he was one of the few really good-hearted men I have so far met with. If he were in London, I really think I should take courage from my desperation, and put my case before him, and ask his help however, is not in London, and so it's no use wishing. Well, I feel more of a man for that shilling's worth of food and drink, and I'll go and wind up my dissipation with a pipe, and a quiet think on the embankment. End of chapter 1